you do get a certain thing. It's stream of consciousness. Yeah. You're, you're certainly getting it. It very much depends on your facility. Um, as most writers, of course, they do the bulk of their shaping and revision. He didn't change the word he wrote. He wrote straight through on events of dream time. Stunned by the power and fluency of the letter Kerouac, told anyone who would listen, Neil is a colossus risen to destroy Denver. In April, stricken with what Ginsburg later described as puppy laws, Kerouac sat down at the typewriter in his Manhattan apartment, inserted one end of a roll of Chinese paper, and hammered out on the road in 20 days. It works like voodoo. By mid-May, Cassidy was complaining to Ginsburg that he hadn't written in a month. There is a dissatisfaction, a basic, deeply disgusting impatience, and feeling of overwhelming inadequacy with words. Soon his letters dried up, too, as Kerouac took possession of his voice, gestures, and childhood memories. Cassidy weakened, even if he'd managed to write more than the autobiographical fragments of his book, uh, more, the first third, which was posthumously published. He would have had little fresh material. So they said to him. In a 1965 Paris Review interview, Ginsburg described Burroughs as a very tender sort of person, but very dignified, shy, and withdrawn. He was also the only one in the circle who seemed immune to Cassidy's charms. What Burroughs liked in a young man was a capacity for intimacy, which Cassidy did not have. He did not need to be entertained. On the contrary, he needed a receptive audience. He used, to, he used the word receiver for his routines. I don't see myself writing any sequel to Queer or writing anything more at all at this point. I wrote Queer for Marker, he told Ginsburg in October 52. I guess he doesn't think much of it for me. The owlish, barely bisexual Louis Marker, Burroughs boyfriend in Mexico, had read the novel and told him, oh, it's not a bad yarn, but don't get the idea you're anything in the way of a writer. And Burroughs' feelings of hopelessness eddied out from his writing to his chances of love. I don't see my going through this deal again, and of course the possibility of mutual attraction is remote. He was very lonely and he wrote, he wrote to Ginsburg and said, uh, Dear Alan, I have written and rewritten this for you, so please answer. Routines, like habit. Without routines, my life is a chronic nightmare, gray horror of Midwest suburb. I have to have receiver for routine. If there's no one there to receive it, routine turns back on me like homeless curse and tears me apart, grows more and more insane, literal, growth like cancer, impossible and fragmentary, like the Zerk pinball machine, and I'm screaming, stop it, stop it. <coughs> now, Ginsburg wasn't going to fall in love and stay in love with Burroughs. It, it wasn't right for him. But he did um, eventually find Peter Orlovsky. It's another guy who's um, unclassifiable sexual his lifelong relationship was with Ginsburg, but he also had girlfriends, and uh, they were very important to him. You first saw him in painting. Yes. That's right. Yeah. 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 He walked into an apartment. I believe it was in ten ten Montgomery, mm -hmm. and uh, saw this painting on the wall of uh, uh, Lovsky and felt completely in love. Christmas fifty first out again. So in an interview with Gay Sunshine, how did you imagine magazine today? <laughs> Gay Sunshine. <laughs> very much there. You don't know. No. <laughs> <Gay> skull. <laughs> Sunshine. <laughs> Ginsburg described the raptures of his first night with Orlovsky, completely giving and taking. With Jack or Neil, he explained, with people who were primarily heterosexual and who didn't fully accept the sexualization of tenderness, I felt I was forcing it on them. So I was always very timid about making them, uh, about them making love back to me, and they very rarely did very much. And when they did, it was like blessings from heaven. So this was, um, Orlovsky being primarily straight was, was not an obstacle at first, and he, it was just something that Ginsburg had to deal with in his life, with the other, with the other things we do. Usually, romantic relationships are a little uneven, and this, this one was a little bit uneven. So, there was the little matter of Ginsburg's girlfriend, her girlfriend when he met Orlovsky, Sheila Bushman, however, who got cold and annoyed when Ginsburg told her about Cassidy and Orlovsky. 
It was as if my thing with men had really bugged her. <laughs> Put her off, in the recall. It's 1954. I was like saying, why don't we all go to bed together? But for some reason, she got mad at that. <laughs> there was no problem, it seemed, that group sex could not resolve. When Ginsburg brought Orlovsky with him to Tangier to visit Burroughs the next year, they decided to override the older writer's jealousy by exhausting him sexually. We went to Tangier to fuck Bill, as Ginsburg put it. It worked at first, and the three got along reasonably well. They pulled together, made a bunch, which was a, a, a rat mixture for um, but, uh, but it didn't last, of course. And uh, it, it actually fell apart over Burroughs' misogyny. Orlovsky was upset by it. Burroughs' basic discomfort with women was not dispelled by a heterosexual crisis in the late 50s, which coincided with the loss of his boyfriend, Kiki, and his attempts to kick drugs. I find my eyes straying towards the fair sex, he confessed to Ginsburg. It's the new frisson, dear, and women are downright piquant. You hear about these old characters, find out they're queer at 50. Maybe I'm about to meet the switcheroo. What are these strange feelings that come over me when I look at a young cunt's little tits sticking out so cute? Could it be that? No, no! He thrust the thought from him in horror. He stumbled out into the street with the girl's mocking laughter lingering in his ears, laughter that seemed to say, Who do you think you're kidding with the queer act? I know you, baby. Basically, Burroughs was disgusted by the stereotype of the effeminate homosexual. That was, that was all people thought or saw when they saw the word homosexual in the 50s. And um, it sickened him. He, was, he considered himself a manly type. You know, he was into guns. And uh, could you maybe say a little something about the, the situation of the homosexual in America? Well, we're talking about a whole, a whole culture. That, I mean, when, the, when, the, when the beasts were getting together and starting, also, it was the, you know, the most uh, American activities going on. You know, it was a, it was a very uh, repressive period in general. There was more gay themed work uh, coming out, like uh, I've worked at all, like Capote work for publishing and stuff. Capote's work wasn't gay, but he cultivated a kind of a camp voice to present non gay material, which is the way he sort of entered. Um, what, uh, what writers in the period tended to do if they wanted to do gay material, they would, they would write it out in their manuscript and then they would edit. And Baldwin did that, uh, Robert Dahl did that. Um, yes. Yeah. Pull it, yes. Um, so, um, it was also the famous interview with Liberace on uh, that, uh, what's his name, did uh, uh, Edward, uh, Mar uh, Edward Morrow uh, did a sh an interview with uh, Liberace. You guys know who Liberace was? Mm -hmm. The pianist, the rings, who was this you know, queen you know, by any definition, but uh, and Morrow was as, 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 uh, as penitent, penitent for having you know, gone after McCarthy had to interview um, Liberace for CBS and, you know, kind of hide the fact that this guy is clearly, clearly, a very uncomfortable moment. Oh, Housewives Across the Midwest were in love with Liberace. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, I think my mother was look, in love with Liberace. You yeah. look at him now and you cannot believe it. It's like, you know, Dame Edna in the dance. <laughs> No, he didn't. Yeah, he was was right because he he believed that his his you know um, his his fame his reputation was dependent on him being you know somehow received or misreported. There's a line in Austin Powers where Austin Powers comes out and spin an animation in the '90s and they bring about all people that died in the '60s. Liberace was gay. Yes, <laughs> I love that line. I love that line. It's impossible to imagine. Nobody. John was considered straight. <laughs> John got married and, and was considered straight. And, and now, you know, it is, it's just so commonplace for us now that we, we heard people who appear perfectly straight, but, you know, have, have a tremendous number of gay members that are thinking about. But it's just, it's like a um, It's a very different, very different time. But at the, at the period, it was, uh, oh, it was awful. There were uh, probably some of you in. in read about this about the period, but you know, you could be arrested on the street or in a bar if you were if you were determined to be wearing uh, you know two or three items of clothing that could belong to the uh, 